Our first speaker is Mary Gentile, and Mary is, um, is famous, in, in particularly in, in academic circles, and increasingly, I think, in circles outside of academia, um, for work that she's done on, um, on, on ethics, and particularly the teaching of ethics. And she uh, currently is located at Babson College, and, and Babson made, uh, t made a, uh, what I would say is a bit of an investment in Mary, in, in a sense of, uh, that they took on her, uh, her theme and her center, uh, her idea. And her idea is giving voice to values. And I don't even know if you call it a center or a program, I'm sure you'll explain that to us a little bit, what, what that is. <laughs> call it an idea, All right? So basically they've invested in an idea, right? So uh, she said, I'm at Babson, but I'm really not at Babson very much. I'm all over the place talking about giving voice to values. We use this, uh, particularly Jessica uses this pretty heavily in our undergraduate program in, in teaching ethics and so forth. And it is a, one of the mo more thoughtful, innovative approaches that's used to teaching ethics to, uh, to students in business schools these days. So Mary's going to kick us off with a, kind of a, our first, our first uh, presentation and a, kind of our keynote event. And, uh, uh, and I give you Mary Gentile. Thank you, <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. It's really, it's really nice to be here at Notre Dame. Um, thank you to Deloitte for helping to make this possible as well. Um, I'm particularly happy to be at Notre Dame because when I was kind of cooking up and baking the idea of giving voice to values, which I may refer to as GVV, I slip into that, um, Carolyn Wu, the former dean at Notre Dame Business School, who we all talked about last night, um, was very supportive and invited me to come to Notre Dame and to share the ideas when they were really in the sort of unbaked form, uh, cookie dough form. And, uh, and I got a lot of really nice feedback which helped me to develop it. So it's fun to be here now. Um, I think I have about 45 minutes, is that right, Adam? Yeah? So um, what I'm going to try and do is um, talk fast and just share some stories with you. I'm not going to use PowerPoint. I'm going to share some stories about sort of the idea, the rationale, the origins of GVV, giving voice to values, and then tell you what's happening with it now. And then hopefully there'll be some time for a few questions and then we can talk later as well. Um, so um, I think to begin, it's useful to know where I'm coming from. Um, I, uh, my background in business ethics started in the uh, mid 80s when I was at Harvard Business School. I was there for 10 years and I helped them to develop their first required curriculum on giving voice to value, or on ethics. And, um, and they, I was there for 10 years, as I said. I left in 95, then I started consulting to business schools around the world, and a lot of what I was doing was talking about curriculum development and faculty development around ethics and, and business. And um, around, oh, I don't know, the turn of the last century, you know, around 1999, 2000, um, I had what I call a crisis of faith. Um, and I began to wonder if maybe teaching ethics in business schools was unethical. Um, and you can tell from that question, I'm kind of an earnest person to even be worrying about that. But I just looked around at what I saw, and there were a number of factors that made me kind of discouraged. It relates to some of the things Ed said a moment ago about his depression. Um, but I, I looked at the fact that in my experience over several decades in business schools, every few years when there was a new high-profile scandal, scandal that hit the front pages of the papers, um, donors would come forward, alumni would get upset, and everyone would be saying, what the heck are they teaching in business schools? And then there would be you know, a spate of new centers or new chairs or new courses. Uh, but it seemed like it would come up again. In fact, recently it seems like it's not every five or six years. It's you know, maybe every few months. <laughs> I think some of that is a, is a feature of uh, information technology. So, um, so you know, that was discouraging. Secondly, I got invited to be on a panel. Um, it was a panel of people who dealt with ethics and business education. And they decided they wanted to set it up as a debate. And they wanted two people to be on the side of business ethics education is making an impact. And they wanted two people to be on the, after 20 years of doing this, you know, that kind of thing. And two people to be on the side of, after 25 years of doing this, it's not making an impact. And what was depressing is nobody wanted to be on the side of business ethics is making an impact. Nobody felt they could make, not that they didn't believe in it, want to do it, care about it, but they felt that it was very difficult to make a persuasive case. And then finally, um, 
you know, there's research that was out there that was suggesting they were researching people pre and post business education, and they were showing that people were actually, students were actually, MBAs were actually less concerned about um, their impacts of their actions on other constituencies after doing their MBA than before they did their MBA. So all of these things were discouraging, but probably the thing that upset me the most was just my own teaching and sitting in on hundreds of hours, thousands of hours of other people's teaching and seeing how the ethics conversation played out in the classroom. And these were people, faculty of goodwill and greater intelligence than me, who were really trying to do this well. Better teachers than me were really trying to do this well. But what unfortunately would often happen is that they would present the typical kind of ethical dilemma case study to the students. The students might walk in thinking they had an idea of what the right thing to do was. But the course of the conversation would be about how really it may not be that, that clear really um, you know, uh, when you think about the cost to the investors or when you think about um, the realities of operating in this region of the world or when you think about um, the kinds of pressures you're under from the competitors, you know, maybe this isn't so bad and even if it is, really how would you ever get it done? Okay, so even though that's not what the faculty intended to be teaching, the faculty intended to be teaching people to think rigorously about these issues, which is a good thing. Um, and they don't want them to be Pollyannas and naive and unrealistic and impractical. But on the other hand, they don't want them to be practical and sophisticated at the expense of values-driven leadership. And unfortunately, I felt that students were walking out of the classroom feeling discouraged, silenced, and experiencing what one professor described to me as ethics fatigue. Um, so all of these things led to my depression, right? So I decided I'm going to take a step back from this work. I'm going to, you know, regroup. Life is short. I want to do something that matters. And around that time, I got a consulting gig at Columbia Business School. They asked me to come in and help them think about integrating social and environmental issues across the core curriculum. And while I was there, they were doing something around ethics. I was not part of designing it, but given my background, they said, do you want to see what we're doing? So what they were doing is they were inviting all the incoming MBA students, which was about 600 at the time, to answer one question upon matriculation, like during orientation, just write a paragraph. And the question was this, tell us about a time when your values, your own values, conflicted with what you were asked to do in the workplace and how you handled it. So they wrote these little essays, and because I was there, they said, do you want to read them, Mary? So I read hundreds and hundreds of these essays, well over a thousand over a couple year period. And that was really instructive. It was not scientific research, this was self-reporting, it was very provocative. So let me tell you what we saw. First of all, if you think about who comes to Columbia Business School, these are people who've been in the workplace for four, five, six years already, okay? So they have a little bit of experience. So the first thing we learned is that I can count on one hand the number of people who said, I was never asked or ordered to do something that I thought was wrong. They all had that experience already, okay? The second thing we learned is if you think about the kinds of students who go to an MBA program at a school like Columbia, it's in New York City, certain industries are more heavily represented. The financial services firms, the, the big accounting firms, the big consulting firms, the McKinsey's of the world, um, some pharmaceutical, high, some high tech. So the kinds of scenarios we were hearing got very repetitious very quickly because of their background. So we were hearing things like, I was told to inflate or deflate my billable hours um, in ways that were not consistent with what I was actually doing. I was told to alter the, financial, the equations I was using to evaluate, and the benchmarks, to evaluate the relative attractiveness or lack of attractiveness of a particular financial transaction in order for my firm to encourage our clients to do the thing that would maximize our revenues. Okay? Um, I was told to puff up the capabilities of a new product, a new piece of software or a new pharmaceutical product beyond what we really could legitimately claim at this point in order to um, increase sales. And then there were always the ubiquitous human resource issues, you know, hiring issues, firing issues, discrimination, fairness, that kind of stuff. So the scenarios got very repetitious very quickly. What was interesting is that the responses differed and they fell into some recognizable buckets. So the first bucket, the largest bucket, a little less than half of them said, yes, I encountered this kind of values conflict, and it bothered me. It didn't just roll off my back. But I really didn't think there was anything I could do. 
um, you know, realistically, practically. So I just sucked it up and I did what they told me to do. That was the largest group. And then there was a small group who said, I encountered this kind of values conflict. It bothered me. It bothered me so much that I could not bring myself to do it. But I also couldn't think of any option. So I removed myself from the situation. So these people got themselves transferred to a different, different boss or a different work group. And some of them even quit their jobs. But that was a small group. Okay? The remainder of the whole group, about a third of them, said, I encountered this kind of values conflict. It bothered me. And I tried to do something about it. And a small group of those folks said, I tried and I failed. Okay? But about a quarter of the whole group said, I tried, and by my lights, I was successful. So I thought, well, that's really interesting. What's the difference? You know, the, these are similarly qualified people. They're coming from the same industries. A lot of times, it's the same companies. They're describing the same scenarios. Um, what is it that means that some of them are able to do this and some of them are not? And so we started thinking about it. And we thought, well, it's not because some of them are good people and some of them are bad people. Because our question, by definition, said, this is something you th feel bad about. This is something that conflicts with your values. So they were identifying as something they felt uncomfortable about to start with. It didn't seem that the, the one group was more sophisticated or more organizationally savvy than the other group. Because in these little essays, when they talked about the reasons why they did not act or how they did act, um, you know, they, they showed a certain understanding of what organizational reality and politics are like. Um, the scenarios they came up with some of them who were able to do this were really clever. They came up with these ingenious win-wins, you know. But some of them were clumsy and, and even, you know, downright naive in the way they approached it. Um, so, you know, those didn't seem to be the factors. So we, you know, we kept looking at it. We had a, a research associate who was slicing and dicing the stories, looking for patterns. And in the end, the only thing that we could say is that at some point, the people who were able to do this effectively said something, or did something. They said something outside of their own heads. It may have started out to a spouse or a partner or a friend, but eventually it found its way into the organization and it changed the trajectory of things. And so it seemed like that was really, in the end, the only difference. That people started to say something and it changed everything. So when, when we saw that, I was discouraged again. Because I thought, well, there's really nothing I can do with this. You know, for a moment, I thought maybe there's going to be a, something about teaching that I can learn from this that's going to help us to think about how to be more effective in the classroom. So I was a little bit discouraged. But then I remembered some research that I had seen back in my days at Harvard. It was research that was done quite a while ago now, um, about 30 years ago, I guess. And it was research on moral courage and altruism. And it was done by a couple scholars who decided to interview people who had acted with courage and um, um, you know, uh, altruism in, in difficult, stressful situations. Um, and so they decided to identify people who had been rescuers during World War II, you know, people who had put their own lives at risk to help others who were uh, endangered by the Holocaust. And they thought, we'll do these in-depth interviews, and we'll identify if these people have any common characteristics or experiences, <coughs> background. So they did, and you know, as is the way with that kind of research, if you look for it, you find it. And you usually find seven things, and they did. <laughs> and frankly, I don't remember what most of them are. But there was one that really stuck with me. It resonated with me back when I was at Harvard, and then it came back to me after this experience at Columbia, which was that they reported that the people who had found ways to um, act courageously in these situations um, were people who reported that at an earlier point in their lives, usually as a young adult, with someone they respected who was more senior to them, so it might have been a boss or a teacher or a mentor or even a parent, they had had the experience of rehearsing out loud what would you do if, and then various kinds of moral conflicts. Now, of course, they couldn't have predicted the Holocaust, but these people had had the experience of both coming up with the, forming their intent, coming up with the words for their intent, and then expressing it, voicing their intent to someone more senior who stood in as proxy for the kinds of people they might have to deal with 
in their lives at another point. So I sort of thought, well, that's kind of interesting. They, it was, it's about rehearsal, right? They rehearsed. So I started looking around at the research, and um, you know, it looked like we started doing interviews with scholars, and, and we also started talking to people in business, from everyone from boards of directors of public companies and CEOs to recent graduates from business school, and gathering stories. And what we began to see is that increasingly there was a lot of research that was suggesting that um, the way to have an impact on people's behavior is not necessarily an exclusively cognitive <laughs> approach. You know, it's not necessarily um, just making the arguments with them and teaching them the, the, the lessons and the analysis. It's actually giving people the chance to practice, giving people the chance to act their way into a new way of behaving. It seemed that that was an important part of education. It seemed increasingly that rehearsal was important. And we were seeing that in research out of social psychology and cognitive neuroscience and even kinesthetics. I remember when I was at, at Harvard Business School, for the first time in my life, I felt the need to take a self-defense class. I had never felt that need before. I'm not sure why, but I did. And I took a class, which some of you may remember. I think they have a new name for it now, but it used to be called model mugging. And what they would do is instead of just teaching you the moves, you know, sort of, uh, you know, fist to nose and heel to incep and knee to groin, you know, instead of just teaching you those moves in the abstract, they would have some guy come in dressed up like the Michelin man, all padded, and he would literally attack you. Now, you'd already have been introduced to these moves, but then he would attack you full force and your job was to use them, use the moves, and to defend yourself. The idea was, and there was research to, suggest, to support this, that there's something called, I'm not an expert on this, but I, it just triggered thoughts for me. Um, it's called specific state muscle memory. And the idea is that if you learn to do something when you're in the same um, psychological and emotional state, the same adrenalized state that you might be in where you need to access that ability, that even if your brain freezes, your muscles remember. Okay, so for me that was a metaphor for part of what we were talking about too, is you know, trying to create defaults, trying to create comfort with those defaults through practice. So as I said, you know, there certainly was closer research in the fields of social psychology and cognitive neuroscience around how we remember ideas, how we phrase ideas, um, the literal expression of ideas that create pathways and patterns. But you know, for me the compelling example was this physical example. Um, you know, you think about it when you're an athlete, right? You, you, you know, you learn, you learn these serves and you practice them, but you have to have model tournaments, you know? You have to learn it in the times of stress, too. So, all of these things came together and I started thinking, hmm, rehearsal, important. That's good, that's good. This may be a usable tool. Let me go back now and look at what we do in business education. Well, then I got really depressed <laughs> because what we typically do in ethics education, and this is what we would explicitly say, you know, with all the best of intentions, is we'd say we do two things. We can't tell people what's right. We can't be normative in our educational experience. And so what we do is we teach awareness and we teach analysis, okay? Awareness meaning I'm going to show you the kinds of values, conflicts, and ethical dilemmas you might encounter in your work experience so that you will recognize them when you encounter them and be prepared for them. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a really good thing to do, especially in a time when business is more global, so you're having experiences that just don't match, just don't map onto the experiences that you might have had in your, the country where you grew up, or the region where you grew up, or the industry where you grew up. Um, it's also a good thing in a time when technology is changing so rapidly. Um, our ideas about intellectual property are evolving as we sit here today, right? Ideas around privacy. There's a whole issue now about Google and their new privacy policies, you know? So these things, we, we do need to raise students' awareness to the kinds of sophisticated <coughs> problems that they're going to encounter. However, if you think about the stories I talked about at the beginning of this, this story and I said, you know, um, you know, I, I was discouraged because of the times when these scandals would hit the front page of the paper and, you know, CEOs were doing the perp walk and all of that. Those were times when people actually often, not always, but often were times when it was really around breaking the law. It was really around fraud. 
It was really around more black and white issues that most of us, not all of us, but most of us would have recognized as actually over the line. Okay? But somehow it felt impossible to handle them differently in the context. And so we thought, okay, awareness is necessary and important, but it's not sufficient. It's not the whole problem. The other thing that we typically and explicitly said we would do in business education is analysis. And what we mean by that, it kind of relates to, again, something that you said, Ed. We would teach people the tools of ethical reasoning. These come out of the discipline of philosophy. Utilitarianism, deontology, virtue-based ethics. The idea of teaching these ways of thinking is that it disciplines our reasoning. It means that just because I think it's wrong, I don't assume you think it's wrong. And it means that I assume that um, there's probably information I don't have and I need to get it so that I can actually make a, a, an informed and a, and a just decision here, a just choice. But again, analysis, necessary as it is, is not sufficient because these models of reasoning by design conflict with each other. I think the best way to illustrate this is a story. I told you that we interviewed a lot of people when we were developing this. One of the guys I interviewed was a CEO and entrepreneur of his own consumer products firm, privately held here in the US. He was quite successful. And I was talking to him about ethics in the workplace. And he, he, at one point he said, you know, we were talking about business education, and he said, you know, Mary, whenever I hire an MBA in my firm, that's a big hire for me. And so I get my staff to do all the screening of candidates. But if we think we have a good one, I get to do the final interview. And if I agree, I make the offer personally. And he said, I recently had a guy in my office who had just graduated from one of the top business schools. And he was sitting in my office, and we were talking about business education. And I asked him, I said, did you take a business ethics class? And the guy said, yeah, it was required. <laughs> and so the CEO said, well, what did you learn? And he said, well, I learned all the models of ethical reasoning, utilitarianism, deontology, virtue-based ethics. And then I learned that whenever you encounter a values conflict, you decide what you want to do, and then you select the model of ethical reasoning that will best support what you want to do. <laughs> now, you know, he said this with a little wry smile. And he was kind of yanking my chain because I was the ethics lady, you know. But there's a certain bit of truth to that, right? You know, these, these models do not tell us what's right. They do, by definition, conflict. They're meant to make us think better, which is an important thing. Don't get me wrong. Um, but in the end, they not only don't tell us what's right, they don't tell us exactly how to get it done. So I thought, all right, we teach awareness. We teach analysis. Where's the rehearsal? We don't have that. And so what I would thought what we need to do is to add the third A. We need to add action. And so if we're going to teach about action, we need to have a new pedagogy, a new pedagogical model. So I looked at you know, what we typically do in business schools. I used to run the case writing program at HBS. I know what those cases are like, as do you. They're usually 15, 20 pages long. They feature the senior executive, CEO. At the end of the case, usually he leans back in his chair and looks out the window and says, what should I do? and the students will debate it for 90 minutes. This is an excellent way to teach them to look at lots of data, see things from many perspectives, be analytic. It does not teach them action. And so we decided we're gonna create a different kind of case. We're gonna create short cases. They're um, you know, often just a paragraph, sometimes they're two or three pages. Um, they feature people at all levels of the organization. And the most important difference is, at the end of the case, the protagonist in the case knows what he or she believes the right thing to do is. So instead of the question being, what should she do, the question is, this is what she wants to do. How can she get it done? What does she need to say? To whom? In what sequence? What data will she need to support that? Does she need to build a coalition? What will the pushback be? I call them the reasons and rationalizations. What will the objections be? And then what should she do? And we actually created this as a template and a protocol. We created it for students so that their, their experience here is not analyzing and figuring out what's right. It's once you know what's right, how do you get it done? And they work in teams. They create scripts and action plans. They then present them to their classmates, not in an adversarial role play, but in a peer coaching context. So if I'm presenting to you, your job is to say, well, Mary, that part was persuasive, but I would never buy this. And then to help me 
make it better. So we're working as a team. So the experience the students are having in the class, it's not what the faculty at Harvard were always worried about uh, what they called the halo effect, you know, that we would teach an ethics class and people would tell you what you, they thought you thought the right answer was, and it didn't really mean anything. It's not that. This is we're saying, we, you know, we're not even saying you have to say you think this is right. We're asking you, what if you thought this was right? How could you get it done? So now, where it used to be, unfortunately, when I would sit in on these classes or teach these classes, that the way a student showed that he was smart and the way a student showed that she was sophisticated and she bent around the organizational block was to voice the skeptical, if not cynical, perspective and to kind of say, yeah, Mary, that's all nice, well, and good, but in the real world, you can't act that way. What we've done here is we've taken that out of the equation and we've said, what if, what if you thought this was the right thing to do? How could you get it done? So now the way I show I'm smart and the way I show I'm sophisticated is figuring out a viable way of getting done what everyone says it's impossible to do. I can give you an example of this. I just spent um, a couple weeks in India in November and December, and I was teaching a program. <laughs> I, was, I was actually kind of scared about this, but I was teaching a program for a group in Delhi and a group in Bangalore, and it was a group of faculty who teach entrepreneurship in India and Indian entrepreneurs. And they, they wanted me to do Giving Voice to Values, but they said, we're going to call it something else. So they, they sent me the brochure. They called it Practical Ethics. Okay? So I came into the room, and they're like, you know, I don't know, 30 people in each group. It was a two-day program in each place. And, you know, basically we came in there, and they were all kind of like, this doesn't work in India, Mary. You, know, you can't be an entrepreneur in India and not... Um, succumb to some of these kinds of pressures and the corruption in the environment, et cetera. And so, you know, we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we introduced the approach. We gave them, there's various stages. It's not just cases. There's a, there's a part where we set out the thought experiment. There's self-assessment part. There's a lot of stages to it. But when we got to the cases, what was fascinating to me is that the same folks who had come in saying you can't do this we're getting all engaged in trying to say, well, you know what you could do is you could make this argument to this person and then he would put pressure on this person and, and they all got into it. And the, in the fact, I, I uh, invited a colleague of mine who's Indian who lives in Goa to co-teach with me because I'm shy and two full days standing in front of people seemed like torture to me. So she was helping and it was funny when, she, when the case discussion on the last case came, and it actually was a, a business issue, a property rights issue, but it pitted Hindu against Muslim. So it was pretty intense. People got pretty worked up, and they started lapsing. Not only there was English, there was Hindu, and then Sanskrit. <laughs> you know, I had no idea at certain points what they were saying. Of course, she could speak right back to them in the appropriate language. But it was great. You know, They very much got engaged with it, and that was what was encouraging to me is that it takes people out of that space of just assuming you can't, to just saying, look, there's no pressure here. You don't have to fear being naive. We're simply saying, what if you were going to do it? We're not telling you you have to do it. And that is, in fact, the giving voice to values thought experiment. We, we always say to people, this is a thought experiment. We're not saying that this is always, uh, we're not saying this is ever easy. We're not saying it's always possible. But we're simply saying it's really important to try and you're going to be more effective, more likely to be able to try if you've practiced. And so what we, we did is we gathered all of these stories. We created a bunch of curriculum, lots of cases, hundreds of pages of exercises, readings, and cases, teaching notes. We put it all on the website for free. This was all um, funded initially. The venture funding came from the Aspen Institute and the Yale School of Management. Now, as Ed said, it's based and supported at Babson College. I had to make the case when I went to Babson why this should be free because my president there is Len Schlesinger who we met when we were both at Harvard and he said, shouldn't we be charging? You know, Harvard charges. But we put it all available for free. And what's worked about that is that it's a continual pilot. I was talking to Ed at breakfast about um, innovation and what we're learning from organizations like IDEO and, and other consulting firms and companies that are very good at innovation is this idea of putting things out there as pilots continually revising them, engaging your stakeholders and helping to create it. And that's what's happened. The curriculum itself, we created the first 
several hundred pages of it. Now other folks are creating it, and they're putting it on the web. You know, we screen it, but we're putting it on the website. We're making it available for free. Therefore, they're doing it for free as well because they see it as something that's contributing to this global conversation. Um, we started piloting it, just getting people we know to try it. But now it's kind of mushroomed. It's grown much more rapidly than we expected. We're actually on six continents now. We have not made it into the Antarctic. I keep saying that. Nobody has share, shared a lead. But we are um, um, in uh, well over 150 organizations and business schools that we know of. But because it's all available for free, we only know when people write to us and ask questions about it. Um, and everywhere I go, I run into people who are using it who we didn't know. Um, people are adapting it. There's a number of people in this room who are adapting it. Um, and, um, and then now we're getting requests from other schools. So we started out thinking this was for MBAs. Now it's also being used extensively in undergraduate business education, as with Jessica's class um, and with Chris's class. Um, but also um, it's being used in exec ed. It's being used in corporations. We're going to hear later from, from Blair, from Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin is probably the firm that's taken this the furthest in terms of using it in their own internal um, ethics and compliance training, and now they're looking at bringing it into their leadership development. But there's other companies who are approaching us now who want to use this as a basis of rolling out, for example, their new uh, value statements, their new missions, et cetera. But we're also getting requests from other disciplines. So schools of engineering have started using this. Um, I just met with uh, the faculty from Northeastern School of Law. They're going to use this as a basis of their legal co-op experience that they use for their students. And then they want to make it available to other law schools. I'm going to Australia in a few months to work with some medical schools there that want to use this in their medical ethics education for physicians. So people, the idea in and of itself is, is not rocket science. It's fairly simple. It's just asking a different question instead of asking what's the right thing to do. We're saying, when you know what's right, how do you get it done? So people can grasp that pretty quickly and then start applying it to their own contexts. And that's been um, really gra uh, gratifying. I'm going to just say one more thing, and then um, I think close, so there's maybe some time for some questions. I think that um, one of the most important things about what we tried to do with Giving Voice to Values is we decided we needed to flip the assumptions about ethics education. Because I was depressed. I was feeling like we weren't having, despite many, many good intentions and despite individual impacts that were positive, I didn't feel like we were having the, the more global impact that we wanted to, I mean global not in the geographic sense, but in the wide sense. We weren't having the more global impact we wanted. So we flipped several assumptions. The first assumption we flipped was, who are we teaching? When I was at HBS, we sat down to design our first required ethics course. And we imagined the toughest nut, most um, cynical, most individual self-interest oriented student we could imagine. And we said, he or she is the person we need to persuade, influence. Okay? And um, I thought, you know, I don't think we're getting anywhere with that approach. So what we decided to do was to flip our vision of who it is we're trying to teach. So we, we borrowed this model from some re research that had been done on ethics and negotiation. But we, we thought about a bell curve, OK? If you assume the students in your business ethics class or the people in your company fit under a bell curve, just assume this. Let's just premise that at one tail end of the bell curve, there are people who would self-identify. Nobody fits into these categories all the time. But people who would self-identify primarily as opportunists. Okay? And we'll define opportunists as people who say, um, I will always act in the interest of my own personal self-interest. Values be damned. Okay? That's what motivates me. All right? So there's a group there. And then we'll say, the other tail we'll call idealists. And we'll say, these are people who will say, I will always try to act according to my values, regardless of my material self-interest. What we premise is that the majority of the students in the MBA classroom, and perhaps the majority of the people in some of your organizations and companies, fall under the bell. I put myself there. And we call those people pragmatists. And we define pragmatists as people who would say, I would like to act according to my values as long as it doesn't put me at a systematic disadvantage. Now, this is not the same as saying, as long as I know I will win. 
It's not the same as saying, as long as I know I will never pay a price. It simply means, as long as I think I have a shot. So what we've decided is, if you think about your classroom that way, I'm not really going to focus on teaching the opportunists. I don't think I have the power to change them, OK? Or maybe the legitimacy. I'm not so worried about the idealists. I wish they were more competent, but I'm not so worried about them at this point. What I'm focusing on is the pragmatists. And I'm saying what we would like to do is to give you the tools, to give you the skills, and importantly, to give you the rehearsal, the practice, to be whom you already want to be at your best. And that's the way we're framing it. And then we present the thought experiment. So what happens is that for the more cynical students, and, and especially this works when we talk about going globally, people often ask us about that, is that we're not coming in and saying, we're telling you what's right, we're telling you what your values are, that sort of normative fear. Instead, what we're saying is we know you have values. We want to give you the skills and the tools to empower you to be better able to enact them more often and more effectively. Okay? So we flipped who our audience is. The second flip we made is what we're teaching. Okay? We're not teaching the analytics, the process, the cognitive process of how do you actually figure out what's right. That's important. People are doing that very well, thank you very much. But what we're doing is saying, but once you know that, we're going to teach about how you get it done. And then the third flip we're making is actually the pedagogy itself, what we actually engage in in the classroom. And what's interesting about that is that although I've been talking about rehearsal, I've been talking about practice, there is a cognitive aspect to this. But it's not the usual ethics analytics. It's not the usual philosophical analysis. Rather, what it is is taking all the tools and the skills and the language that you're learning from your other disciplines in business. So from accounting and from operations management and from strategy. And in particular, some of the stuff you're learning in your organizational behavior and your leadership and your uh, persuasion and negotiations classes and saying, use all those tools in the service of what is right or what you believe is right. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of research now about how people make decisions. And I think there's some people in this room who, who work in that area. There's a lot of um, research in behavioral economics, behavioral finance, social psychology, et cetera, about how people make decisions. We know a lot about decision-making biases and heuristics. We know a lot about framing problems. We know what the um, biases we tend to fall into are. We discount the future. We are uh, in, uh, disproportionately influenced by immediate impacts. Um, group think, social consensus bias, false optimism. We know about all those things. What we typically do in business education, and a lot of education, is teach people those biases. And the idea is now you can be proof against them. Now you know these biases, so you won't fall prey to them. The problem is we also know from research that that doesn't work. We know that what happens is if I teach you about groupthink, you're going to recognize it when I engage in groupthink, but you're still going to be vulnerable to groupthink. Okay? So it's useful to teach it, but it doesn't necessarily make me proof against falling into those traps. And so what we say is, let's know about those biases. And then let's say, you know, these are evolutionarily successful biases. I mean, they wouldn't have developed if they weren't. Um, and the idea is, let's actually, if I know that people are vulnerable to this kind of pressure, to assuming that everyone agrees with them and nobody thinks this is wrong, then what I'm going to do is to create another social referent group for them that suggests another perspective. So I'm going to go out there and build a coalition of people who can share my perspective. Or if I know that people discount the future, I'm going to actually find a way to make the impacts of this decision feel more near term, et cetera. So what we do is we use these cognitive tools, but we apply them in the service of an already stated values-based position. So those are the three flips we made, who, how, I mean, who, what, and how. And then we started sharing it. So I'm going to stop there. That's really the approach. We've been kind of blown away by how many people are picking it up and taking it much further than we ever anticipated. Um, our, our goal in the beginning was if this got taught in ethics classes, that'd be nice, but we really wanted it to be taught in accounting classes and marketing classes and OB classes and 
supply chain classes because we thought the nice thing is you don't have to, as a faculty member in those areas, preach about what's right or teach philosophy. What you do is you say, here, this is something we know. How can you get it done? And use the language and the tools and the skills of your discipline to do that. Um, and that's been, I think, the most gratifying part of, well, there's two things that have been the most gratifying part. One is that, in fact, it is being used in accounting classes and in negotiations classes and in supply chain management classes. That's very gratifying to us. I think the, the other gratifying thing is when we hear back from faculty um, or from individuals who say, you know, I, I did the GVV class and yesterday I was at my job and I tried it, <laughs> you know, and it worked. And we're starting to hear that too. We're actually, people always say, do you have measures of impact? And, and um, Ed referenced this uh, earlier. Um, we have three ways we think about that. One is that this, this approach is based on a lot of empirical research that's already out there about how people behave, where we do have um, you know, empirical data that suggests that this does affect people's behavior. So we feel fairly confident of the method. Um, secondly, um, there are faculty increasingly who are doing like pre and post tests and even starting to design some research studies so that we will be able to have this kind of data. Um, in the, there's a professor in Australia who's been doing some pre and post tests for several years now and has some very, um, fairly significant results that suggest that students' readiness and preparedness and commitment goes up from this experience. But then finally, as I said, you know, for me the impact is when I hear about people who actually have used this and it's actually changed their behavior and I can share some of those stories if you're interested. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you for letting me talk about it. I like to tell the story. And uh, I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah? If, if there are any questions, suggestions, comments. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> Yeah. Of the situation and tell us what the advice was from right. the professor or the group. Right. We don't tell them what to do. We actually um, ask them to generate the action plans and the scripts. We do have, you know, a case and then a B case, what actually happened. And most of the cases we try to feature are people who did figure out a way to get the right thing done. And so we share what they did. Um, but we want the students first to generate that themselves. I can give you a brief example. There was a, um, uh, one, of the, one of our cases is about um, an MBA student who uh, shortly before going into uh, her MBA was working for a financial um, firm and um, her they, they managed the, uh, they were portfolio managers for high net worth individuals. And her boss, who was relatively new, told her one day, we're presenting to one of our clients this afternoon, his portfolio underperformed the benchmark that we had identified for his basket of investments. Um, I want you to select a different benchmark, redo the analysis so that we can make it look like the portfolio did better. Um, and we're gonna present it to him this afternoon. She felt uncomfortable with that. She went through a number of stages, talking to different people, gathering information, checking. In the end, you know, there were, the issues of this guy is new in this job, um, so he's really, you don't have a relationship with him, so it's not gonna be easy to convince him of anything different. There's a short time frame here. We're presenting to the client this afternoon. There's not time to build a coalition. Um, you know, um, the benchmark that he's asking you to use, conceivably you could make a legitimate case that it is the right benchmark to be using. So there were lots of what we call reasons for rationalizations for why she should just, oh, she was new in her job too, so the stakes were high for her because she didn't have a track record, didn't have a lot of relationships. Lots of reasons why she should not or could not act. In the end, what she, and then the students are given that example and they're supposed to generate what would you, how could you make this happen? Not what would you do, but how could you make this happen given what she cares about? In the end, what she did is she took all of those reasons and rationalizations why this couldn't work and she flipped them. She figured, he's relatively new, my boss, so there's a way I can present this to him that it's not his fault that this underperformed. So she took care of saving his face. Secondly, she took the time frame issue and she said, she went to him and she said, you know, we don't have time to redo the whole analysis in a way that's going to be persuasive. Um, thirdly, she took her newness and she used that to her advantage and kind of said, you know, we're all new in this situation. I don't think that 
I mean, I think we have, uh, um, what do you call it, a, um, a legitimate sort of uh, reason for explaining why um, this happened. And finally, she came with a proposal. She said, I know why this didn't work. I know what happened in the market during this, uh, during this period. We can, here's how we can present it to our client with a, an alternative plan for going forward, how we are confident this is going to turn around. She presented all of this to her boss, and he said, okay. <laughs> and they did that with the client, and it worked well, and the client bought it, et cetera. There was more detail in the case. But, you know, basically, it wouldn't always work. It worked in this instance, but the, but the interesting thing is that she would never normally have thought to even try that, um, you know, because of all of those reasons why you couldn't act. So what we always say to students is this isn't easy, it won't always work, but there are some things, there are assumptions we make. I call them preemptive rationalizations. We always say to people, you know, you're working along and, you know, something happens, you get that feeling in your gut, this is kind of dodgy, someone's asking you to do something, whatever. But before you even think about what you could do, how you could change it, you're so aware of all the reasons why this is going to be hard. We call those the preemptive rationalizations. Maybe I don't have all the information. Maybe this is standard operating procedure in this industry. <coughs> Maybe this is standard operating procedure in this business. Maybe the market's already discounted for this, or the client's already discounted for this. Maybe it's wrong, but it's really not my responsibility or authority. Maybe I'll do more harm than good. All of those things rush in. So what we say is, and some of them are true, but what we say is you're in that moment, you get that feeling in your gut, all these preemptive rationalizations rush in. Let's just, in a safe space, in the classroom or in a training, corporate training context, let's spread out the space between the moment when you encounter that feeling in your gut and the moment when the rationalizations rush in. Let's just spread that out and in that safe space say, but what if? What if you were going to try and do something? How might you be effective? And then we give them tools and we give them a set of questions, a template to go through, to work through the alternatives. We give them some uh, examples, and we let them practice and generate ideas. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, as we've put this idea out here, different people have started taking it into different realms. So there are some faculty who are looking at GVV and sustainability, and they're looking at GVV in nonprofits or GVV in specifically in finance. In this nonprofit realm, there's a, actually a couple faculty working on this, including one in Ireland, and um, doing interviews with executives who either started or are EDs, executive directors for nonprofits. And one of the things that they find is, first of all, they encounter all the ethical issues too. You know, they've got stakeholders, they've got donors, investors that they're responsible to. They have board governance. They have um, you know, accountability to government funding if it's in fact a state-funded kind of initiative. They have all these same kinds of pressures. The thing that's different, so a lot of the stuff just applies. The thing that tends to be different is. Um, they have some different rationalizations. <laughs> one of their rationalization is this woman I'm working with in Dublin says it's that she, one of the people she interviewed said that we have to, we have to do bad to do good. <laughs> and they have this idea of themselves as doing good, right? They have this, and, and you know, they, I'm not questioning their sincerity, but that sometimes means that they are more susceptible um, to certain kinds of rationalizations about what they might do in the service of doing good, and that that might actually lead them to shortcut before they actually examine some options that will lead to greater accountability in the long run. And so what we're finding is that we have to frame the issues, and I found this when I talked to a group of uh, social entrepreneurs as well as entrepreneurs, that if you frame it as just ethics, sometimes they bristle a little bit because they kind of say, my whole reason for being <laughs> is doing good. So why are you talking to me about ethics? You know? And so part of what we try and talk to them about is what are your values? What are the things that make you uncomfortable? What are the things that make you feel like in order to accomplish your mission, you feel that your values are being compromised? And we kind of, so we have to be careful framing it that way with that group. But we find that the tools are very similar. They have to figure out ways to deal with their stakeholders just as business has to 
figure out tools to deal with theirs. And of course, that rationalization applies in business, but in a different way. I mean, we've got a lot of research out there now that suggests that the higher you get in the organization, the more you tend to kind of drink your own Kool-Aid, and the more you tend to believe that you're behaving ethically, even if when you were at another part in your career, you might have questioned these behaviors. And there are lots of reasons why that's true, and they're not because people are evil. It's kind of you're, you're surrounded by people who are giving you positive feedback. You know the stakes are very high. They're higher for every decision you make. And so there is a self-protective measure in terms of wanting to, to protect your, you know, avoid cognitive dissonance and to be able to see yourself as a good person. Um, you know the impacts you're going to have are very wide reaching and you identify more with your organization and your role than you might have when you were younger. So there's lots of real reasons why people do that. Um, but it's something that we unpack and we give them the opportunity not to say you're wrong, but simply to say, but what if you wanted to do something different? And to let them practice that. So. We uh, probably need to hold those questions. I'm sure there'll be more and opportunities to, to ask and answer them. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.